the Lubrizol 360 podcast, an inside look into the science of performance. Welcome to the Lubrizol 360 podcast. I'm Andrew Markell, the director of content for Import Car, Brake and Front End, and Underhood Service. This is the first in a series where we're going to talk about oil and the importance of selecting the right oil for your customers. Oil can be very complicated. No longer is it just one grade, but it's multiple grades and multiple specifications. So you need to make the right selection for your vehicle, especially when you're confronted with new technologies on engines like turbocharging, direct injection, and changing oil pumps. Lubrizol is a chemical additive company that sells a lot of the additives in the oils that you put into your customers' vehicles every day. You can't buy their products off the shelf, so you rely on their technology even though you don't know it. Today we're talking to engine oil additive experts who will tell us what to watch out for when selecting the right motor oil for your shop and your customers to ensure that you're protecting their investment in their engines. So today joining us are Matt Gieselman and Martin Beers from Lubrizol. And Martin, would you introduce yourself and what do you do at Lubrizol? Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Um, I manage our passenger car motor oil business for North and South America. That basically means making sure that we've got the right products in the market uh, to meet the uh, current needs. I will point out that we don't sell to the end user. We are silent partners of oil companies, so you won't see the Lubrizol name out there. Uh, we are working very closely with all of the oil marketers of passenger car motor oils. So essentially, you're the Intel on inside on oil. That is correct. And Matt, what do you do? Hello, thanks for having me. Uh, I am a chemist, and I formulate engine oils. Uh, so there's a lot of performance testing that goes into defining um, the minimum performance requirements for an engine oil, and that's what I take care of. So let's get started with our first question from one of our readers. So you've got the recommendation from the OEM. You've got the oil life monitor. How much are those two components built around the oil formulation? Well, yeah, so the uh, with those oil life monitoring algorithms, you know, the the automakers spend a lot of money and effort on, uh, uh, you know, full vehicle dynos, engine dynos, and testing of the lubricant that's in the crankcase uh, <clears throat> to check its physical properties throughout the course of a of a vehicle on a specific drive cycle, check the health of the oil, um, check things that we worry about in the lubricant industry, like what's the viscosity of the oil after a certain period of time? Um, what are its chemical and physical characteristics? Um, and so they put a lot of money into writing smart algorithms for those, for those systems. And that uh, data is based on the lubricant that's actually in the crankcase. So, so they're not uh, they're not doing that research with some special lubricant that you're not going to have access to in the market. They're going to be doing that research, which leads to that algorithm, which leads to that number that gets displayed uh, on your on your display in your automobile um, uh, using the lubricant, and it's all it's all based on the interplay between the chemical properties of the lubricant and the mechanical properties of the specific piece of hardware um, that, that you're driving. Let's talk about the technician. He's sitting there at the fender of the vehicle. He's got the oil drain, he's got the new filter in place, and he goes to select the oil for the vehicle. What does he need to know and what should he be researching? First and foremost, the uh, OEM will recommend the vis grade and the quality level. So how do you figure that out? Quality level is two things to look for. It's called an API donut, and that'll tell you the service classification. Um, the second one is the starburst. And what the starburst is, is a measure of how the OEM ensures that the vehicle is protected. So what do I mean? It's protection of the engine, protection of the fuel system, protection of the catalyst system, the emission system. If you choose the wrong oil, you can, uh, for instance, if you're using an E85 uh, gasoline, you, you'll have some issues with respect to emulsion. 
um, phosphorus, which is a component in the engine oil, could have an impact on the emission system. So you have to be very careful. The API donut, what that basically does is uh, ensures that you have engine protection. So the OEM has gone through and said, I'm measuring all of the performance aspects with the various engines, and that's what we test against. Then the other part of speech is the viscosity grade. You know, if someone says thicker is better, that's wrong. Uh, nowadays, the OEMs on the oil caps will have very clearly the uh, what quality levels required and what viscosity grade is required. I'll give an example. Uh, Toyota and Honda have been using 0W20s for many, many years. The engines are designed to run on those thinner oils, and we can talk about what the 0W and the 20 mean, but that is the right viscosity grade. If you put a, if you put a thicker grade of oil in there, you, in all likelihood, will cause engine damage because oil is too thick and doesn't flow to the critical parts. There's an old apocryphal story in our industry about a service technician who... Uh, when filling an automobile that called for a 5W30 was caught putting a 10W40 uh, in the crankcase, and when asked why, it's be- he said it's a better oil. It's it's a 10W. It's got twice as many Ws as the 5W30 does. It's not really how it works. Um, uh, you know, if if the if the automobile owner owner's manual calls for a 5W30. It's because uh, the automakers designed that engine and the tolerances within that engine and the oil gallery pressures within that engine um, to work with that viscosity grade oil. There are automakers out there now that in their service manual recommend 0W16s. Lots of 0W20s, but also some 0W16s appearing uh, now. And there are some uh, OEM branded oils in the marketplace that are even lower than that, 0W8, for instance. So, uh, you know, those aren't very widespread, at least not yet. Um, But your vehicle was designed on the engine dyno and on the full vehicle dyno with a specific viscosity grade fluid present when all the design work went on. That's the fluid that needs needs to go in there. Um, a little bit more technical um, layering to what Martin was talking about with regards to these logos that you'll find on a bottle of oil. The API service donut, which is the API service category, and the starburst. Um, there's two kind of intersecting industry groups um, that license those logos and in order to obtain a license to put that logo onto a bottle of oil you have to meet some minimum minimum performance standard and that's the that's kind of the core of my job as a as an engine oil formulator is to make sure that the products that we sell meet those minimum standards and it is a minimum standard not a maximum standard or a medium standard but a minimum standard Um, and so Uh, There are oils out there that go above and beyond meeting that minimum standard, but at least if you have those licensed logos on the back or or front of the bottle of oil, actually, I think they're supposed to be on the back, I don't don't remember, Um, but on the bottle of oil, um, then you know that that oil has been sweated over by formulators around the industry, such as myself, um, and... uh, passes a bunch of engine dyno tests uh, at some minimum performance level that it, that it needs to pass. So you're talking about ILSAC, API, and ASEA certifications. Yes. So uh, the ones that I personally deal with most are API and ILSAC. And in North America, that's mostly what you find. ASEA is, um, well, let me, let me just give you a little bit about who are in these groups. API is the American Petroleum Institute, and it, it consists of companies um, such as oil marketers and automakers, um, as well as other interested parties. ILSAC um, is uh, mostly just the automakers, uh, both in North America and in Japan, um, that have this industry group um, that gets involved in setting these specifications. ASEA is um, kind of the equivalent to ILSAC, only they're the European automakers. And they have their own... um, series of specifications with their own aims and their own testing 
um, uh, with different limits than, than what you have for an ILSAC or an API oil. Um, there's a lot of overlap, but they are different. So an SN oil, is that ILSAC or API? That is an API oil. So the thing that's in the service donut, like SN or SN plus right now, um, that's, that's going to be an API spec oil. And ILSAC is GF5 and GF6? Yes. So, so anything that's the, the, the gasoline fuel, the GF5, 6 spec, is the Starburst or the ILSAC um, oil. Yeah. And then ASEA is A, B, and C oils. A, B, and C oils, right, right. So API and ILSAC, but then there's a th- another category of performance, and that's GM's Dexos 1. So that basically is uh, really all of the API and ILSAC requirements, but um, some additional tests that GM have uh, decided that it, their engines require higher level of performance. Right. Dexos 1 is, is a very interesting specification. Um, uh, currently, if you, if you have an oil that meets Dexos 1, it almost assuredly or, or probably usually will also meet the API and the ILSAC minimum specs. It's a higher spec. It's a higher quality oil. It'll be more expensive because of that. But um, GM put a lot of thought money and time into designing that specification as kind of a hand, higher standard to uh, protect uh, their hardware and their their uh, engineering. Also, uh, there will be, so in addition to that Starburst and that API donut, there's a third licensed logo that you will sometimes see on the back of a bottle of oil, and that's the Dexos 1 um, logo. So that's what you need to look for if, if your owner's manual indicates that you need a, a Dexos 1 uh, a lubricant. So we have all these standards that we talk about. I guess the one comment I would make, most reputable brands will carry the pertinent credentials that are required in today's marketplace. So back to that guy at the fender. He's getting ready to pour in that oil. He's looked through the owner's manual, and he's looked through his service information. And he sees, let's say it's a Chrysler, so he has an MS specification. Or let's say it's a Toyota, and you have a world specification. How can a technician be assured that those ILSAC, API, and ASEA, does a manufacturer's specification trump those in some cases? Yeah, so uh, yes, um, you, you need to find an oil that that will carry the manufacturer's specification. Chrysler's a, an interesting example. Um, Dexos One uh, with GM, they went kind of the route of we're going to develop engine dyno tests that that define our specification. Chrysler, they do it differently. They they want you to do field trials um, uh, in actual vehicles in service in the field, um, and so that's how they they define a quality oil. Um, uh, again, you, you'll never go wrong following what's in the owner's manual. Now, it can get confusing for the, for the person changing the oil because uh, sometimes these specs look complicated and it's hard to find on the bottle or, or in the product literature of whatever oil you're using. Okay, does it cover this spec? But uh, I'm not aware of any reputable oil marketers that, that uh, won't put all of the specs that they cover on the bottle um, and they won't put specs that they don't cover on the bottle okay so they they're they're all you know it's a pretty honest industry in in that way you should be able to find it in the product literature or on the bottle so I was gonna say you could search the web for whoever the manufacturer is of that lubricant they will have a product data sheet or at least refer to what the specifications are. And they, as you say, Matt, Matt, they do a very good job of listing all of the OEM specifications that they meet. The other benefit of using the more current oil in the older vehicle, the fuel efficiency. You've got additives in there that are more, they're modern, that'll lend itself to better efficiency of the vehicle. So your engine's probably gonna be more efficient in the long run with that newer style of uh, engine oil. So what is the W number, and why should technicians obey that number, like the differences between a 5W30 and, let's say, a 10W30? The number that goes with the W gives an indication of how thick the oil is at cold temperatures. 
Um, and there are some very standard bench top viscometric tests that you run to define whether an oil is a 0W, a 5W, a 10W, et cetera. And as the number goes up, uh, the oil is thicker at cold temperatures. Okay. The number after the dash um, gives some indication of how thick the oil is at hot temperatures. Okay. So, you know, a 20, 30, or 40 grade will have ever increasing viscosity at higher temperatures. Okay. Uh, and again, there are uh, s industry standard bench tests of viscosity that define what the viscosity grade of an oil is. There are specific additives that, that make it possible in the modern world, so for the past 20 years or so, um, 20 or 25 years, to um, formulate what are called multi-grade oils. Okay, so the automaker has already engineered the hardware um, uh, such that it needs a specific viscosity at cold temperature, say when you're heading into the winter, and let's say it's it's a it's a Toyota Camry and they Toyota Camry and they call for a zero W. They've engineered that hardware to be on a zero W, whether it's the middle of winter or the middle of summer. Recently, I would say earlier this year, guys did a paper on LSPI in regards to some of the General Motors vehicles and the low speed pre ignition problem. How much does the oil formulation and additive package uh, add or contribute to that problem? Well, it has a large effect, and that's the first time you hear that. That sounds surprising when you when you know what low speed pre ignition is. It's it's uh, for those who maybe have not heard of it in certain vehicles, and and it's usually um, uh, turbocharged gasoline direct injected engines. Um, uh, for cert for the for, for that type of hardware, you can get um, pre ignition of the fuel charge before or before intended timing, uh, even before spark timing um, in, in some cases. Uh, so uh, you, you would think, okay, that's, that's a thing that's occurring in the combustion chamber. What does the lubricant in the crankcase have to do with that? Um, and it turns out the lubricant has a large impact. Okay, now the probability that an LSPI event occurs if you own a vehicle like this is low, but it's not zero. Okay, um, the the probability that it happens if you use a properly formulated oil to help avoid LSPI is still not zero, but it's much lower than even the low probability uh, that exists if you use an improper lubricant. Um, the the chemical and physical mechanical mechanism by which the lubricant affects this is complex and not extremely well understood, but um, it seems to be kind of a complex interplay between small event amounts of lubricant um, that are in kind of the what's called the crevice volume of uh, the first between the first land and the top oil ring um, uh, in the combustion chamber um, that mixed with fuel um, that can get mixed in with that so unburnt fuel that can get mixed in with that lubricant and also there is the potential that uh, combustion chamber deposits can play a role as well but uh, some combination of one or all of those things um, can lead to this pre-ignition. Um, now, it, it sounds a bit to, if you, if you know anything about engines, it sounds a bit like knock. Um, it's not knock, or rather, it's similar to knock, but, but uh, it, it, phenomenologically, it, it has a little bit of a different outcome. Um, in that it can be a lot more knock leads to weird noises. So what is the um, driver experiencing when a pre LSPI incident occurs? Well, uh, it can range from as innocuous as just a weird noise coming from under the hood for a second or two, and then that's it. Um, if the pre ignition is severe enough um, and occurs early enough before spark timing, um, you can actually get damage to the vehicle. And that can include actually breaking off pieces of the piston. So when a, imagine a, an ignition of fuel occurring during the compression stroke 
of, of an operating engine before top dead center. Okay. You can imagine that that's, you know, the, the, um, you know, the immovable object meeting the unstoppable force. Right. Um, so in the middle somewhere, the, the hardware can break. And as I say, there is some low probability that every once in a while it will break. So bits of, of the piston, especially near the, the top, like the first and second land, um, can break off completely. And so uh, the end user experience might be now you hear a rattling underneath the hood and low power. low power maybe you limp home and that's as far as the car is going to get and in the most extreme cases perhaps you're just stranded on the side of the road um the engine oil light comes on or the engine service light comes on to tell you that something's gone wrong but you've already probably figured that out yeah. You bring it into the shop, one of the first diagnostics will be check the compression in each of the cylinders, and they will see a significant reduction in compression. Yeah. And then when the head's removed, that's when you observe that the piston has physically broken. So after the piston land has been destroyed or other internal damage to the engine, to the crankshaft, the bearings, the conrod, the only option is to replace the entire engine. Yeah, I mean, there's no, there's really no coming back from that. You just got to take the engine out uh, and replace it. Or your other option is to use the correct oil and, and, and greatly lower the probability that this happens to you in the first place. So that's, that's the key. Uh, turbo GDI engine requires a unique oil, and it is available. As Matt said, it comes in two forms. It could be a Dexos 1 Gen 2 or an API SN plus oil. And this is going to be a synthetic oil? Well, for Dexos 1, yes, that's true. It, it will be a synthetic oil, or, or most likely will be a synthetic oil. You can get conventional a API SN plus oils out on the marketplace. So to wrap up, is there anything you'd like to add, Matt? No, thank you for having us. It was fun. Uh, Andrew, thanks for having us. Uh, a great opportunity to help to educate the advisors on the importance of selecting the right engine oil for the vehicles. Well, thank you for listening to our podcast. And join us for our next podcast. We'll be discussing LSPI and how the additive package of the oil can control it. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Lubrizol 360 podcast. Visit lubrizoladitives360.com to learn more.